Good morning. It is April 21st, and this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. So we're going to move on to uh, hear testimony about S120. And I know that folks who are here with us this morning understand the, the time crunch that we are under. And I appreciate the comments that I've had back from you about that. So I look forward to your testimony. And I know that many of you have testimony that Nellie is putting up on our webpage that may extend further than your uh, comments this morning. And we will certainly look at, read all of the testimony that we get. That's our job. Um, but please don't make it a thesis. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so 120, and then there are sections of 132, I think that people are commenting about. I have suggested um, streamlining 132 and adding some sections into 120, uh, some some changes, and I think that Jen had um, put put my suggestions together, and I don't I don't see them on the web page yet, but we'll we'll get to that. That's would, would you like them on the web page? Um, I'm happy to have them there, you know, and I think it might help folks, uh, all of us, because I feel responsible for 132, and if there are sections of 132 that are problematic or that people want to support that are not included in my triage, uh, I think it's helpful to know that up front. I will send it to Nellie. Okay. All right, so um, let's move along. Oh, I got, first, I have to have my agenda in front of me. Thank you. There we go. Um, I'm gonna go in, the order of the um, agenda. And then I do know that there are a couple of other folks who have asked to testify. For example, Helen Laban of the FQHCs has asked to testify. And so she would be also added on to our agenda and looking forward to hearing everyone's comments. So thank you. Lynn Stanley is, uh, Lynn, are you here? Lynn, thank you for being here. Terrific. I am. So it, please introduce yourself for the record, and then we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Lynn Stanley. Um, I am the Interim Executive Director for the National Association of Social Workers of Vermont Chapter. With your permission, I would like to uh, turn it to Michelle Deneau, who will be giving our testimony today. Fine, that's fine. But I am available to answer any questions. Terrific. Michelle, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony as your committee moves forward on S120, the Joint Legislation for um, Healthcare Affordability Study. As you know, my name is Michelle Denault. I am an MSW candidate at the University of Vermont. I am here with Lynn Stanley, the interim director for the Vermont chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. We would like to bring to your attention the importance of mental health providers to both healthcare affordability and access. Per the findings of S120 regarding the Biden administration's willingness to partner with states to pursue non-traditional reforms, we bring this proposed reform to your consideration. Over the years, this committee has acknowledged the value of loan repayment for nurses and primary care providers. We ask you now to look at the value of loan repayment for mental health providers. Um, is that upon graduation, these professionals must find high paying jobs so that they can um, earn enough money to pay for the loans rather than work in the areas of the greatest need, which are far often than not lower paying jobs. Loan forgiveness would make it significantly easier to recruit and retain mental health care providers where the need is the greatest. In Vermont, unlike New Hampshire, there are no state loan repayment programs for mental health providers. There's a federal program through the National Health Service Corps, but that program is very limited and does not provide widespread loan forgiveness. The New Hampshire state loan repayment program allows certain healthcare professions, including mental health providers who agree to work in mentally underserved areas in New Hampshire. Because the study in S120 requires outreach to stakeholders and institutions, we think this issue could have a place right here. 
we would request the following amendment. And then we have submitted um, wording for it, but I can go through it right here. It would just say section two, joint legislation, healthcare affordability study committee report. C, power and duties. The committee shall consider the following and it would be under number, number six, studying the viability of a state level state student loan forgiveness program for licensed mental health clinicians, including licensed LICSW, licensed psychologists, licensed family therapists, and licensed mental, mental health counselors. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Very good. And we would love to entertain questions, but we're going to restrain ourselves. But we're, we're, we are, and just so folks know, we are very familiar, I think, with the areas that you all will be talking about. And we greatly appreciate your taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Thank you. And we're going to um, move on. So both Lynn and Michelle, thank you both for being here. And we can reach out as needed for clarification. So we're going to move on to Jessa Barnard uh, of the Vermont Medical Society. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. I am Jessa Barnard, the Executive Director of the Vermont Medical Society. We represent physicians and physician assistants from across the state in different specialties and employment settings. Um, I wanted to start my testimony with a little bit of framing of how I see S120 and S132 um, and the different goals of the bills. We really see the distinction between healthcare coverage and affordability issues, which we see S120 primarily addressing, and then payment reform and delivery system reform, which are all payer model and ACO are working on. And we see 132 is working on largely elements of that with a couple coverage provisions. And I think some people's frustrations and the testimony I've heard on, um, on frustrations with the all payer model is that it's not really designed to change health coverage. Um, that's not the purpose of, of an ACO or, an, or the all payer model. Um, so we, uh, the medical society supports the intent of S120 and looking at changes to coverage, expanding coverage. But I think that's important to just keep in mind that we, we really need both elements that we probably can't expand coverage in the way we would like if we can't if we're not also addressing payment reform and restraining growth in healthcare costs. So we need both, but there are different tools to work on those two elements of health reform. So on 120 specifically, we do support looking at affordability of healthcare. The Vermont Medical Society actually since 1992 has supported universal access to comprehensive and high quality health care um, with the, the intent that it focus on investment in primary care, reduced administrative burden, and public health interventions. Um, we share the frustration that patients experience when they can't afford recommended plans of care or can't seek care in the first in place due to out-of-pocket costs. I would like to support what the healthcare advocate said regarding 120 and what I think you'll hear from Vaz later today, which is that there is amazing opportunities right now for Vermont to make healthcare more affordable under ARPA. And while we support looking at healthcare affordability in other ways as well, we really don't want to lose sight of this opportunity that the state has right now in making sure that Vermonters know that their healthcare um, may become more affordable already. Um, that's actually one of the largest issues that we hear of as providers is the out-of-pocket costs for the cost of commercial care on the exchange. And so we actually think there are tools happening right now that will really address a, a lot of that. So we want to keep the focus on that. Um, we do also have two recommendations if S120 moves forward. Um, again, keeping these two separate buckets of payment reform and expanding coverage, we think including the language around the study of the all-payer model is a little bit of a distraction from helping Vermonters afford their health care. That could take over the entire work of this commission. It is being extensively studied already. You've heard testimony about that. There's a federal analysis going on. Um, so we don't want to lose sight of the the piece around affordability for Vermonters. And um, so if there is going to be an element of payment reform that's incorporated in this work, we suggest it's bigger picture to the point I made in the part, initial part of my testimony that it's a review 
of the role of payment and delivery system reform in minimizing healthcare cost growth and how that works together with coverage reform. Because um, again, we think you need both, that it's not a one or the other. You need payment reform if you're going to potentially um, be looking at expanding how many people we're covering or how we're covering them. Um, second, you've heard from a number of witnesses regarding 120 that simply having health care coverage does not translate into access to health care coverage. For example, um, Patrick Flood, I, I really supported his statement that basically the coverage is no good if you can't get in to see your doctor or if there aren't enough primary care clinicians in the state. Um, we know you've heard from a num number of primary care providers already this session about how they're struggling under the current Medicaid program and the rates the Medicaid program pays, which is why we've actually been, been talking to your committee and, and asking for increased primary care rates in Medicaid. We really think it's crucial if you're looking at expanding public options for health coverage, what those payment rates and program design options look like that would ensure fair and sustainable payments for healthcare providers and that provide patient access to care, especially primary care. Um, we don't think you can look at expanding access without looking at what that access would look like both for patients and providers to make sure that it's uh, meaningful coverage and that it, we don't actually lose un unintentionally lose healthcare providers and primary care providers um, based on what that program looks like or the, or the rates in that program. And so those are my comments on 120. I will shift to 132. I will say I have not looked at the, the new um, draft yet, so I don't know which elements are, are carried forward. I'll keep my comments somewhat high level. There are more detailed comments in my written testimony, which I submitted. The, the two elements of 132 that we do support are the expanded hearing aid, aid coverage, which was section 12 of the original bill, and the eliminating of cost share for primary two primary care visits in section 19. Um, there was a lot, there was testimony last session in the Senate Finance Committee on expanding access to primary care. I won't repeat all of it. We have some comments in our testimony about the importance of access to primary care services. I've also uh, submitted a letter, I hope it's on your website, from Dr. Harrington and some other um, physicians and hearing providers at the U UVM Medical Center in support of hearing aid coverage. So hopefully you have that in front of you. Um, we are concerned with unintended consequences of several other sections that were in the bill. I think I will, um, again, they're in front of you in, in writing, um, I will skip to just mention the piece about um, provider rate and contract review. We fully support fairness and equity in contracts between insurers and clinicians. We do have concern that the submitting every um, contract to the Green Mountain Care Board for review inadvertently gives even more power to insurance companies who would have more staff and capacity to shepherd those contracts through a Green Mountain Care Board review process. We've suggested if this is an issue the committee wants to continue to explore, replacing a contract review regulatory process with the ability for small practices to more effectively work together in negotiating contracts and rates with insurers. That would be an amendment to existing statute that allows healthcare provider bargaining groups currently only with public payers as opposed to private payers. Um, so that's our one language suggestion. And again, I, I hope you have a, some time to look at our other testimony on other sections, but not knowing which have been carried forward, I will um, skip those details for the time being. All right, thank you. And we, and we do have, you have very specific comments on um, 132 as well as 120. So that is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we'll move on to Heather. Is it Heather Reimer? Heather Reimer. I'm sorry, Heather. All right, no worries. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so I'm Heather Reimer. Uh, I'm the director yeah. of AST Vermont. Uh, we represent 5,000 um, healthcare and higher education professionals in Vermont, uh, members in every county. Um, and I, I just want to focus on, I guess, briefly two things. One, and, and I know you all know, but I think it bears repeating, um, you know, our members who are healthcare workers see the personal costs of Vermonters delaying healthcare um, because of the cost and the tragedies that can come out of that. And I think that's something that we have to, um, I, I hope, I know you all are, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, to keep that at the forefront of our mind. And delayed care often is more expensive for everyone. Um, and obviously there are some real personal tragedies um, from that. The other piece of testimony I would just like to say is that um, uh, the sort of wasteful, bloated healthcare system is a burden on employers. You know, one of the things we do is we bargain, right? We bargain with our employers and we happen to represent members 
who only work in the public sector and for nonprofit hospitals. Um, and you know, it, it keeps wages down. Um, it makes it, the budgeting hard uh, for employers, and again, especially for nonprofits and um, and uh, state and, employ uh, and public employers. You know, and it'd be one thing if, if of all of that money that we're all putting into the system, we're going to provide the best care possible. Um, but you know, we know that we pay more and get less health care than um, most countries. And you know, there's a lot of waste and bloat in the system, um, some of which we can control, I think, in Vermont, and some of which we, we can't. Um, pharmaceutical companies is more of a, a federal level piece. But you know, I'm really hopeful with this new administration in DC that there may be opportunities for Vermont to move forward on that and really create, um, uh, our, our members have ratified, you know, we want the full thing. We want nobody, you know, you pay uh, through taxation for healthcare and you don't pay a penny when you go to the doctor. I know it's gonna take some time to get there, but we think that S120 is an important um, step toward that and appreciate the work that you all are doing on that. Um, but again, we think there's an opportunity here to move forward, to advance the case. Um, and I think we could be strategic and ready for it. Um, so uh, we support the bill and um, uh, continue to look forward to working with you all to you know, bring uh, high quality healthcare to everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well said. All right. Um, Susan Risden is here from uh, Health First. So Susan. Good morning. Thank you. I will be brief because I know we have uh, limited time, but I will first off say that I have to agree with almost everything that Jessa had to say. Um, so I'll just put that out there. Um, regarding S120, oh, and for the record, I'm Susan Ritson from Vermont Health First, Independent Practice Association representing physician-owned practices across Vermont. We do support S120. We think affordability is a critical issue, um, as is the shortage of healthcare professionals. Um, well, Jess's point is very um, on point regarding um, the all-payer model, um, having a different goal than affordability um, per se. Uh, we do think an evaluation of the all-payer model um, is prudent. I know there's some evaluations going on. There are some concerns um, that the evaluations may be biased um, toward finding um, a positive um, outcome for the all-payer model. So we do have some concerns about that. Um, so, and, and we think that the state is uni uniquely positioned to uh, look at all their alternatives, um, especially given um, the change in the federal administration. And we have the opportunity to be, um, you know, look at, to be novel, uh, try novel, unique approaches. So moving on to S-132, I also have not seen what has been carried forward. Um, I will say that we support many of the presumed tenants of S-132, such as transparency, fairness, um, and increased access to primary care, as well as hearing aid services. We do have some concerns about um, how the bill proposes that we get to some of those things. Um, for example, really appreciate the fact that um, you're looking at, um, you know, the AC, uh, ACO administrative salaries. However, we think linking the salaries to the primary care physician um, might miss the mark um, and uh, make it difficult to recruit um, the skill set needed to make an impact um, as far as the ACO, as well as potentially um, limiting um, the attractiveness of Vermont by other ACOs or uh, entities who wanna do business in Vermont. And we, we think competition is needed. Um, so it might, we think it's more important that um, whatever model we have is able to show a clear and measurable uh, positive return on investments. Vermonters can actually feel uh, what the model is doing. And that um, may, if, if we can see a positive effect that that's money well spent on the salaries. Um, regarding the contracting provisions of the bill, we definitely appreciate the attention to this matter. Um, we do um, support a system that distributes our finite health care dollars in a transparent and fair way that isn't uh, dominated uh, or ruled by market dominance. 
Um, we think that uh, the, the bills aim to uh, have the Green Mountain Care Board look at every contract, uh, might be trying to get to this. Um, we, we, while we applaud this presumed attempt, uh, we have concerns that that's not practical. And, and uh, like Jessica suggested, we think provider bargaining groups, um, the ability to negotiate uh, with payers might be a, a, a more practical way to get to that or even requiring basic um, contracting guardrails. On um, the issues of price transparency and market dominance, um, we believe that um, legislature and perhaps the um, Joint Fiscal Office over the summer can take a look at the um, price transparency data that is now out there, uh, mandated by CMS of the 300 shoppable codes and the Green Mountain Care Board will be publishing um, a report um, based on VH Cares data and discharge data and using those two data sets to help inform and direct healthcare efforts. Um, this, this information has been long awaited, so let's use it. Um, also support the provision related to inclusion of specialty care and healthcare reform that's been missing and important. And we also suggest that um, there's some language that directs the ACO or other healthcare reform effort to encourage the use of lower cost sites of care when appropriate. Um, that doesn't seem to be happening now. And you know, Vermonters are paying for um, hospital prices for care that doesn't need to be delivered in a hospital. Um, lastly, we strongly support the provisions related to hearing aids as well as the um, uh, cost share elimination for primary care visits. Um, as you know, we, uh, any, uh, the out-of-pocket costs can be a barrier to people accessing primary care, which can lead to higher costs down the road um, if they're delaying care. Like uh, Jessa mentioned, we do have concerns that our primary care network um, is already strained and needs to be bolstered um, before you know, we can just assume that they can handle this um, you know, these, these uh, visits. Um, so uh, we would like to see, you know, in more investment in primary care in the terms, in, in the way of, um, as we mentioned in previous testimony, increased um, Medicaid, Medicaid payments, um, loan reduction or debt reduction, scholarships, um, and decrease of administrative costs. So uh, in summary, we support the tenants in the bill. Um, in my written comments, we'll have more details on you know, some of the things that we suggest that you consider um, changing or adding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was extremely helpful and I appreciate your comments. Um, we're going to move on to Betty Keller, who is the president of Vermont League of Women Voters. But Betty, you sent me a little note in the chat or everyone that you have folks to um, representing different perspectives. So, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and then introduce the folks who you have here who will be testifying. Thank you much. So I am actually not the president of the League of Women Voters. I'm the oh. president of the Vermont chapter of the Physicians for, Na for a National Health Program. I I'm on the health care committee for the League of Women Voters. My name was swapped in for Sue Racanelli, the president, who deferred to me to speak on this health care bill. OK, thank you for that clarification. And then I have with me here um, Marvin Malik. Um, Dr. Marvin Malik is a practicing primary care physician. He's, he's on the phone and trying to deal with patient care while he's getting ready to jump in here. Um, <laughs> And um, he'll be able to speak from a practicing physician's perspective. So I very much um, think that that will be beneficial to you. And thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Well, good morning. So thank you so much for inviting us and um, giving us the opportunity to speak on the Healthcare Bills 120 and S132. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Vermont for whom I serve on the Healthcare Committee. The League of Women Voters of Vermont has strongly advocated for Vermont to pursue a universal publicly health funded health care system for a long time and recently has been active in raising concerns about the lack of accountability in our accountable care organization. We are also concerned about the failure of the Green Mountain Care Board to perform the work for which it was actually created. I absolutely recognize that good people can have different opinions about how to achieve a shared mission 
and my good colleague, Dr. Malik, does not share all my opinions about S120, but right now I'm representing the League of Women Voters. Some of you here have worked very hard for a very long time to try to reduce healthcare costs for Vermonters and very much want to actively be working on something to make things better. Thank you for your passion. I would like to share with you a few of the sections of Act 48 that are particularly relevant as we look at S120 and S132. From Act 48, the healthcare system must be transparent in design, efficient in operation, and accountable to the people it serves. My comment, our current healthcare system is not in any way transparent or efficient, and it has become less transparent, less efficient, and less accountable since OneCare has been inserted into our healthcare system as an additional, totally unnecessary layer of administration. I'm not entirely convinced that this study committee is necessarily a good use of taxpayer money. However, if you're going to do another study, by all means, in my opinion, this is the most important sentence in S120, which must be retained. Section 2C, the committee shall consider the following, the efficacy of Vermont's all-payer accountable care organization model and the changes to the model that would be necessary to make healthcare more affordable for Vermonters or whether an alternative model may be more effective. It would be more efficient to cancel the ACO project or at a minimum to not renew it. The legislature doesn't have the authority to do that, but you could pass a resolution asking the Agency of Human Services and Green Mountain Care Board to not renew it. You don't need a study to review these simple facts. ACOs are based on the idea that people use too much health care, but we don't in the US and we certainly don't in Vermont. We can't afford to because we can't afford the deductibles and co-pays. Integration of care and coordination of care are a couple of phrases that are used to speak of the purported benefits of an ACO, but you don't need an ACO to do those things in a rural area with only one hospital and not that many practitioners. Mostly, you need to allow time in their schedules to talk to each other. That doesn't require an ACO and an ACO may actually make it harder. What we want right now is affordability and access. This ACO has nothing to do with improving access. If you actually take money away from the services, you reduce the access. So that's why it does belong in, in 120. It does have to do with access as well. And there is no way they can improve affordability. The way to improve affordability is to reduce administrative costs. And an ACO is added administrative costs. One care is a monopoly. A single private ACO as a monopoly is dangerous. We need a single risk pool, but it must be transparent and accountable, which one care is proving it is not and it will fight. Several private ACOs with defined geographic borders and a monopoly within the borders of each carry the same risk. Multiple risk bearing entities competing on the same turf cannot save costs because they will be spending money trying to compete. They will be lemon dropping and cherry picking if at all possible. They will be gaming the system for billing. They will be increasing administrative costs and reducing quality of care because of the nature of the beast. And in a rural area, this competition would only fracture care instead of coordinating it. From Act 48 again, primary care must be preserved and enhanced so that Vermonters have care available to them, preferably within their own communities, and that these health services be sustainable. When you talk about payment reform or value-based payments, the payment reform that is really proven, used in multiple countries that spend far less on healthcare, is global hospital budgets. Global budgets could also be used for other entities like clinics and long-term care facilities. But the green, what the Green Mountain Care Board calls global budgets are actually imposters. I urge you to get a five or 10 minute lesson on what they really are and teach it to every rural hospital administrator and CFO in the state and you will see a huge difference in the attitude of rural hospital administrators toward a system that actually used them. That could be a good use of time while the study committee is speaking with stakeholders. From Act 48 again, Vermont's healthcare system must include mechanisms for containing all system costs and eliminating unnecessary expenditures. The mechanism, mechanism to remove the most obvious unnecessary expenditure and source of excess, excess cost growth would be to eliminate one care. I'm particularly alarmed at having heard that we won't be able to test the model because expenditures rating to, related to the pandemic will throw the data off for not just 2020, but for 21 and 22. I'm flabbergasted that this state of fiscally responsible citizens would commit to this project under, this, under these circumstances. That we would sacrifice needed services like addiction services so that rural hospitals can pay their fee to the ACO is astounding to me. Again, from Act 48, the financing of healthcare in Vermont must be sufficient, fair, predictable, transparent, sustainable, 
and shared e equitably. There will be disruptions someday when we transition to a national health program. I was disappointed that on a federal little level, so little was done to deal with the health care crisis while we were already moving money around to help companies, families, states, and communities weather the economic impact of the pandemic. That would have been the perfect time to take up the federal Medicare for all bill, but here we are. In Vermont, we are looking at how to use some of the money to help people pay for their health insurance. In S120 section two, powers and duties, the committee shall explore opportunities to make healthcare more affordable for Vermont residents and employers, including identi identifying potential opportunities to leverage federal flexibility. And then in section five, you talk about opportunities made available by the Biden administration to expand access to affordable health care. I urge you to add, or through pursuing other programs with a state innovation waiver through section 11332 in the ACA. So here, here is where the public hearings come in. As long as you are traveling around the state, what are the most productive ways to use those hearings? Number one, teach what ACOs are. Most people can't even begin to understand what they're doing. What, are their max, what is their maximum potential? What they can't possibly do? How much they cost and where the money goes? Have a doctor present to talk about coordination of care in that local area, how well it works and how one care makes or doesn't make a difference and how it could be improved without one care. Then ask members of the public for their input and make their thoughts loudly and clearly known to the Agency of Human Services, the governor and the Green Mountain Care Board before the contract is considered. Before you go on this tour, decide what innovation waivers you want to pursue and be ready to gather the needed input for your application. There's a strong urge to do something. And there is this feeling that you have to pursue the ACO because you don't have anything else to try. First, do no harm. Sometimes a patient will get better from a useless intervention due to the placebo effect because you were nurturing them. But bloodletting, for instance, was doing harm. ACOs are not a harmless intervention. Even if you don't have a plan B, it is better to abandon this plan A. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, so you also, we have with us- Marvin Malik. Marvin Malik, and you, uh, is there anyone else who will be speaking from the League of Women Voters? But you're, I think you're no, the- I'm the one speaking for the League of Women Voters. I finally and got it. <laughs> and Marvin has connection issues some, oh, oh there he is, there he is, okay. Marvin, you're Dr. Great. Malik, thank you for being with us again. We, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, if your, if your uh, audio starts to go, sometimes it helps just to turn off the video. So, but uh, we'll leave it to you. Um, and please do go ahead, introduce yourself for the record and provide your testimony. Dr. Malik, Dr. Malik, can you hear me? Just send him a note. I'm calling him. It looks like he's doing paperwork with his. Uh, it looks like he's doing some administrative work. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling him. <laughs> uh, we'll just wait one minute. There's a phone number in the waiting room ending with um, 271. Um, is that Dr. Malik by any chance? I'm not seeing it. Uh, he, he went straight to voicemail, so I didn't get him. So, hmm. Oh, I'm it, sending him a note. What did you say the number was in the waiting room? Because he often uses a a phone at the same time that he uses the computer and he's trying, he may be trying to- Can you to hear me now? Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah, sorry for that uh, technical problem on my work computer. Anyway, um, my name is Marvin Malik. I've uh, been a longstanding member of Physicians for National Health Program and for 20 years, the Vermont chapter. And um, I'm testifying today uh, about, I'd like to talk both about cost control and also about uh, the impact of one care and potential ACOs in general. And um, I guess I'll start out talking a little bit about cost control. I'm, I, I think there are limits to what 
an individual state can do. We are unable to get rid of many of the external, source, external sources of funding because they over 50% of the funding of our healthcare system comes from out of state sources. This adds to tremendous administrative complexity dealing with workers comp, auto injuries, Medicare, uh, federal workers, people in the Adirondacks who use our care, people from Florida who are coming up for as tourists or coming up as uh, snowbirds. So it's very, it's very difficult for us to reduce administrative costs, unfortunately. However, there are some administrative costs that could be reduced. Uh, the one that makes my blood boil at a less than 212 degrees Fahrenheit boiling point is constantly listening to advertising for elective orthopedics by multiple hospitals. And I think that the state legislature should make it clear to both to the hospitals and to the Green Mountain Care Board that wasting money on advertising is uh, not something that we're gonna countenance. And that one of, the, one of the more effective cost control strategies that we have and should continue is Green Mountain Care Board regulation of hospital budgets. And I think the amount of administrative expense, including advertising, lobbying, high CEO salaries should all be factored in in the, in the, in the percent increase or de hopefully decrease in hospital budgets each year. So I think the legislature should find ways to uh, make its, its opinion known on those issues. Um, there are a few issues that are also inter largely internal to the state that the state could work on in, to achieve cost control. One is uh, doing all it can to reduce uh, spending on medical malpractice. That is uh, basically an entry of money into the healthcare system that providers and hospitals have to cover that does not end up leading to any medical care. It also does not improve care. And the biggest single intervention that could both reduce errors and improve care is having high quality, a seamless high quality software system that we all share. So that intervention, I actually spoke nine years ago with people from the Green Mountain Care Board, but they didn't feel empowered or able to take that issue on, to create a single seamless software that everyone in the state and ideally the country would be able to use. And I understand the reasons for that, but I just wanna point out that if you're looking to improve quality of care and reduce costs, that would be one of the most powerful interventions. Um, if we had a national single payer system, that would get this whole albatross off of our backs. And the, uh, there is a resolution for state and local governments to support a single payer system nationally. And I, this will not cost you any money to say that you support it and I will mail it to you uh, and so that you can see the resolution and I hope that you'll pass it to indicate to the federal to federal legislators that we want a single payer national program passed. Short of that, um, I think working on reducing administrative costs, the, the ones we have control over would be some of the more effective interventions. Other, the, the final intervention that you could work on, and I actually strongly recommend you do, is the cost of recruiting. That is an internal cost within the state that we can control and we are getting creamed. Small hospitals across the state and really across the country are getting creamed on recruiting costs. I don't know if you're aware that recruiting firms, when they succeed at placing a doctor, they charge, in, say at a hospital practice, which is the usual situation these days, they charge $40,000 as a fee. And I feel like if the state uh, government could expand its AHEC program which is very limited and deals mostly with in-state with in medical students, if they expanded that to a more general recruiting effort, create a website called Vermont, Vermont Healthcare, VermontProvider.com or, or something like that, Vermont.gov for uh, recruiting and follow up leads, hire a couple staff members. I think that would be an intervention 
it wouldn't be as grandiose as what, what you're looking for, but you have the potential to control costs because these $40,000 outlays start to build up when there's enough of them. Um, it, I also think that reducing spending, state spending on what is not working very well would also be another plan. And Vermont Information Technology Leaders is a program that's been going on for well over a decade. I've never used it and I don't know a doctor who has. I've never gotten a single bit of clinical information using any what they have developed. I don't know what they have developed. We get all of our information from Dartmouth and from and UVM and other facilities via fax machines. They're then optically scanned into our record. So whatever, whatever um, payments have been going on to that seem to have produced little utility. Similarly, um, the One Care is an organization. Someone asked me, "Well, what, how does One Care impact your practice?" And I said, "I don't. I don't know that they've there been any impact one way or the other. I don't know of anything they've done." So they're supposed to be helping with coordination of care, but for if I want to talk to a pulmonologist or a rheumatologist or another primary care doctor or a doctor in Florida who was taking care of the patient before, you know, last week if the, where they were down there, a patient was down there, none of that happens. And uh, they, there isn't, there is, so I asked other people who might be impacted by one care. I asked the uh, care coordination team at our hospital and uh, they are funded to some extent by one care if they enter things, uh, if they enter their data elements into the software that OneCare provides. So the software that OneCare provides has the advantage that it actually connects with all the other people involved with mental health patients who need a lot of services, which is an important population. So that's good. Um, and so that, might make you think that this is a great intervention and it's fine. I certainly no objection to all that. I can say, however, that we had the same care coordination teams, really the same people doing the same work before there was one care. It was when back when there was the blueprint for health was primarily involved and that's when it got going. So it was continued, but now funded through, through one care. Um, whether all of the administrative costs through one care are needed to get us the care coordination team is another question. I think it is not. And uh, the other issue is that I have no access to any of the information that there is that's in their software. So the people who do care coordination have to make two entries. One is into the software that I could see in our primary care practice. And the other is the whatever this software that one care has developed. So you can start to see the issues with wasting time and uh, software incompatibility. So um, th that's sort of, and coordination of care, I see them as fine. I, I don't think it's greatly innovative, but you know, to the extent that coordination of care for mental health patients who need a lot of services, to the extent that that's happening, that's certainly a good thing. How much we should credit one care for that is another question. Um, I, in terms of whether one care is likely to save money through uh, prospective payment or abandoning fee for service, that's very problematic because the patients are attributed through primary care while there's the money that you're spending is primarily in specialty care. And we don't really have that much control over what the specialists do. And, and also an individual specialist has a strong motivation to do more, even with one cares negative incentives. Because if they're gonna get paid $16,000 to do a procedure and then get penalized for, for every procedure they do, they might lose $20 at the end of the year that you can see where the incentives lie. And so I think it's gonna be very problematic. The fact that our main referral hospital for Southern Vermont is in another state makes it more difficult so I would be, and then it, one care has high administrative costs inherently. It's not particular to one care. It's what an ACO has to do. So I'd be fairly pessimistic. And uh, one, it's hard, going to be also very difficult to evaluate the efficacy of one care comparing Vermont's spending rate of 
cost inflation, health cost inflation to other states would be one way because most other states aren't very far along either for all these same reasons. So I, I think you may want to not expend money where it's not likely to help. And maybe little projects that are in state that can actually save some money, especially recruiting, um, might be a useful thing. And I do hope you'll support the national single payer resolution. You will be the, we haven't put it very, we haven't done very much to get state governments to do it, but I think if Vermont leads the way on that, it would be fantastic. Thank you very much for all your work. And I know how hard you're trying to improve care for Vermonters. Thank you, Dr. Malik. And I know how hard you, uh, we know how hard you are, have been working on this for uh, many years and appreciate your comments. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, Vicki Lohner of One Care Vermont. Um, are you, where are you? Here you are. Okay. <laughs> here I am. Thank you for being here. And uh, there was someone um, in the waiting room calling by telephone. So I don't know. Uh, it may have been Dr. Malik. I don't know. But now they've hung up. So we won't, I won't ask again for folks who are here if you know who that was. So Nellie's put a message up on chat. So, okay. Um, thank you for being here, Vicki. And uh, we look forward to your testimony. Great, thank you so much. So for the record, Vicki Lohner, CEO, One Care Vermont. And I wanna thank the committee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of One Care and its partnering participating providers who, as Joseph pointed out so eloquently, really are um, committed to helping to change both payment and delivery system reform. And so that's the primary goals of the ACO that were set out under the all payer model. In regards to S120, I do believe that that has to do more with financing and less about the delivery system and payment reform efforts. What I'll say um, about the additional um, evaluation of the all payer model is in the terms of the agreement between CMS and the state of Vermont, there was a very good evaluation framework set up that looked at cost quality um, of the model being performed by an independent evaluator, which is NORC out of the University of Chicago, who has fairly extensive experience in um, both qualitative and quantitative analysis of such models. And it's my understanding that their evaluation of years one and years two will be out later on this fall, that there was a delay because of the pandemic and that work, because it does require them to do interviews with providers throughout the state of Vermont to get their perspective on the model. And so knowing that providers have been really busy caring for patients during the pandemic, there had to be a pause in that. So I would say that adding additional layer of evaluation is unnecessary in terms of S120. I would also note that the all payer model improvement plan that was put out earlier this year by the Agency of Human Services has a lot of nice steps in it that can be taken to provide some continuous evaluation um, and improvements to the model as we move forward. So as not to have to wait for the NORC evaluation, I think there's some, a lot of good work that could be done in between. In terms of S-132, I would of course say that we are in support of hearing aids, primary care support, and moving the innovation oversight to the director of payment reform. There is a tension between having the Green Mountain Care Board be both the innovator and the regulator. So I think that just makes good sense to have that um, transition to the director of payment reform. In terms of the other aspects of the bill as it relates to the ACO, um, we generally oppose all other aspects of the bill. 
what it really sets up is a system where it is diminished um, capability of provider-led payment reform. And that's what this was set up to do. That's what the ACO was set up to do, was to really be provider-led payment reform. And it transfers essentially all management um, operations and decision-making to a very small regulatory body that is not set up with the right expertise to do the work. So I would say if the goal was to increase engagement in the model, this bill as written, and uh, Madam Chair, I have not seen the updates. Um, so maybe many of this um, has been addressed, but it does not support provider-led reform. And I feel that what will happen is that providers will not engage anymore. And that would be particularly um, unfortunate given that even during a pandemic, we had an additional community, Rutland, join because they are so committed to this model and to the work that the state is trying to do. So I would hate to see engagement go down, which would further put us in um, corrective action with the federal government as a result of this. I would also say that there's a lot of additional administrative burden and oversight put in this bill that's unnecessary. The ACO has fairly rigorous oversight by the Green Mountain Care Board, by all of its payers. The ACO, of course, has to have oversight of itself as an entity. We have an independent financial audit every year from PwC. We have a compliance audit every year from an independent auditor. So there's lots of structures set up in place within the ACO. I'm not sure um, what the auditor's office would be able to do in terms of adding value, aside from adding additional administrative cost and burden to the ACO in the system. So, and I would also say that opening up access to all um, participants that are part of the ACO to the auditor's office is going to make um, further engagement with provider participants particularly hard. So as we look to how we move forward with this, I would say that, again, the state has put forward a really nice framework under the all-payer model improvement plan. Um, the <clears throat> recommendations in there in terms of really um, moving insurers to true um, payment reform, such as the federal government, which is a big player in this, would be um, well worth the effort of this committee to look at how steps could be taken to improve um, and move that forward more quickly for both the federal government and for commercial insurers. Currently, Medicaid is the only payer in the state of Vermont that is offering true fixed payment reform um, under this model. So I think others could really um, learn from the work that they've done. I also want to appreciate the work of this committee in house healthcare and appropriations and the Agency of Human Services for making those investments in programs like Dulce, the home health, longitudinal care, and care coordination programs that support providers on the ground. The ACO has not set up an internal centralized structure to do that that's really helping the delivery system to make those changes and reforms that will be necessary to be able to be paid under a different structure. So I think that would conclude my comments. I have submitted um, written testimony as well to the committee. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yes, we do have your written testimony uh, on our webpage and we'll go through it um, completely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have Devin Green of Vermont um, Hospital and Health Systems. 
Oh, you're sitting right there. I'm looking all <laughs> over my screen for you and you're right there. <laughs> this is the problem with Zoom, you know, in the committee room, Vicki would get up and walk over to her seat or her standing area and you would take her place. But so thank you for being here, Devin, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Devin Green, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Thanks for having me in today. I am going to quickly go through um, S-132 and our response to that, S-120, and then I have a little proposal that I'm going to throw out there because it's really important to our hospitals, and I apologize for it being last minute, but it's important and has come up recently, and so I'm, I'm putting it out there. Um, so to start with S-132, um, I saw that these provisions were no longer in the proposed bill, but I want to address them anyway because the overall concept of the bill goes towards healthcare provider delivery and it creates a lot of instability and unpredictability in the healthcare system. So one thing that the bill was proposing was changing healthcare delivery system reform from provider-led and evidence-based to shifting funding, having the Green Mountain Care Board shift funding around. So to a state-based regulatory exercise by a small panel without clinical expertise. And this creates a lot of unpredictability in our healthcare system, these proposals. Um, we saw the unintended consequences of shifting healthcare dollars when the legislature cut uh, DISH funding to hospitals in fiscal year 2018 and redistributed redistributed it to the designated agencies in an effort to reduce wait times in emergency departments for individuals in mental health crisis. Today, ED wait times are longer than they were a few years ago. And in the meantime, that dish cut directly contributed to Springfield Hospital's bankruptcy. So the idea of taking healthcare dollars and moving them from one place to another is deeply concerning to our fragile hospital system. And it comes up every year. <laughs> um, and, and, and so they are in this complete state of instability. I talked to a head of a primary care organization who said that he is trying to decide between investing in EMR and investing in population and health. And he's leaning towards investing in EMR because it's a safer bet. Why should he invest in population health when the sands keep shifting in healthcare reform? So I just want to put that out there in, in terms of the instability that the proposals in S-132 uh, create. I also want to say that I saw that the um, audit of the ACO is in the new draft and VAS does not support the audit of the ACO. Um, the auditor's office already did a report through the Green Mountain Care Board's oversight of the ACO and so this would be redundant. And we also can't support auditing non-government organizations. Um, it really opens the door there and creates a new precedent that we cannot support. Um, that being said, there are pieces that we do support in S-132, including the um, hearing aids, the two primary care visits, and the DMR, um, the DMR reform, and also moving uh, moving the reform pieces of the Green Mountain Care Board over to the Director of Healthcare Reform. So those are my thoughts on S-132. Moving on to S-120, um, this, this bill I see is really supporting immediate affordability for Vermonters. What we've been hearing in the testimony time and time again is Vermonters have high premiums, they have high out-of-pocket out costs, it prevents them from accessing care, they need immediate relief now. And we support efforts for affordability for Vermonters. We've seen an uptick in uncompensated care, which indicates a clear problem, um, and it leads to bad health outcomes for Vermonters and makes our rural hospital system more fragile. So we support affordability for Vermonters, we want to see S120 done in a really um, direct and focused way so those Vermonters will see relief immediately. And I think the best way to do that is to build off of the previous work um, on affordability that this body and previous administrations have done. So we have the single payer report. We have five reports on the universal primary care. 
we have, um, I was dismayed <laughs> to see uh, the, that, that this new group would look at expanding Dr. Dinosaur because we did a 2017 report on expanding Dr. Dinosaur and we found out that it would increase adult premiums by $1,000 a year. And so it really looks like this is a group that's starting from scratch and not building off of previous efforts. And in that, I think that will just increase the amount of time of making headway on this and not give Vermonters the affordable care they need. So please work off of previous efforts and not, um, not do redundant efforts. Um, that being said, <laughs> if we're looking at affordability, the all-payer model and the ACO is not about immediate affordability. Um, it's provider delivery system reform. It's designed to reduce the cost of the healthcare system over the long term by employing preventive services today to create better health outcomes for tomorrow. So while it is making measurable differences for the child in mental health crisis who can now go to the psychiatric urgent care for kids instead of the emergency department, while it's making a noticeable difference for the food insecure diabetic who benefits from greater coordination of care, um, it's not gonna change people's premiums or out-of-pocket costs overnight. Um, so in terms of focusing your efforts, I think it makes the most sense to get regular reporting on the progress of the implementation improvement plan that AH, AH has done, AHS has done. So there's an oversight by the Green Mountain Care Board, there's an oversight by the federal government, and AHS has this implementation improvement program. Um, if you're looking for accountability for the ACO, have them have AHS come in and report on the progress that's happening through the implementation improvement plan. Don't restart from scratch on some separate um, you know, study looking at the ACO when really you could focus on other things that will make Vermonters lives um, and healthcare more affordable going forward. And I think the main thing there are all the incredible opportunities under ARPA. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act. So that act is going to uh, significantly bring in a lot of subsidies for Vermonters. It takes the former benefit cliff where people got subsidies up to 400% federal poverty level and it totally smooths it out um, so that people are getting subsidies uh, up to $76,000 for a single individual. So if you're an individual making $76,000, you'll get subsidies through the exchange. If you're a family of four, um, you'll get subsidies up to $157,000. No one's gonna pay more than 8.5% of their income with these new subsidies. That leads to a bunch of questions. So if you have a lot of subsidies going into the exchange, should people drop their healthcare coverage or not? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> people should not drop their healthcare coverage. <laughs> but do we want to look that at a that? Was a test. We were listening. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> do we want to look at having small employers drop healthcare and cover healthcare coverage because um, people will have affordable healthcare in the exchange? This leads to other important questions. Like this is particularly important for healthcare reform moving forward because when you apply for a 1332 waiver to do single payer or to increase the age limit for Medicare or to do any of these options, um, what they look at is how much you're receiving in federal dollars through the exchange. And they take that money and they lump it to you and they give it to you. So you wanna have a strategy where you are maximizing your federal dollars through the exchange and maximizing your federal subsidies. So these are all really important things to look at. Um, other things to look at is um, we have a premium assistance program that's $5 million. That's additional to what the federal government provides. What do we want to do with that $5 million? Do we want to subsidize other income levels? Do we want to subsidize cost sharing? What do we want to do with that? Um, and then in terms of the primary care visits, one thing that we keep running into when we look at covering primary care is the HSAs, so the health savings accounts, and how they do not allow for coverage until you meet your deductible. And so that's always a barrier, and that should be looked at too. So 
I would say for S120, instead of going broad, um, go, go big, <laughs> but go effective. You know, we know that, um, we know that Vermonters need affordability relief. And so make it happen, line yourself up so that it can really happen this time instead of starting from scratch. The other thing I would do is work with Diva on these, um, on these public hearings that you're going to have. Vermonters need to know there are people in the 400 to 600 federal poverty level who don't know that they're eligible for these subsidies. Go to them and educate them about that. Make sure that they know the opportunities that are available to them through ARPA. So I would just ask this committee to make this, I think this study is important. I would ask this committee to make it really useful and really uh, focus on healthcare coverage affordability. One other opportunity, <laughs> if I may, sorry, is I think in the delivery system reform piece, there is an opportunity to look at care coordination. So the one care has care coordination, um, insurance companies have, have care coordination. Where is their overlap? Where can that still be streamlined, um, but give you the efficacy of care coordination and, and good health outcomes? That would be another opportunity to sort of reduce the costs. So that's what I have on S120. And now is just my quick pitch. Um, totally shifting gears to pharmacy benefit managers, um, FQHCs and hospitals have been dealing with uh, attacks on the 340B pharmaceutical program, which provides subsidies um, for hospitals and FQHCs to keep their doors open and do programs. Um, and we've seen Express Scripts recently require this burdensome reporting requirement. And we are asking for some protective language that can also be found in Utah that would prohibit pharmacy benefit managers basically from creating additional requirements or restrictions on the 340B program. And that's what I have. Uh, thank you. I didn't know that uh, Utah had done, had done that. Um, and I know that when I've met with folks from Utah, they're very active in uh, pharmaceutical coverage uh, costs. So thank you for that. That's new. Okay. And do you, is, that's in your Written. Yes, at the very bottom. <laughs> at the very end, saw it. Okay, thank you, um, Devin. And we're going to um, keep moving along. Uh, we have other folks added on after um, Steve Howard. Steve, I hope you are here. Yes, he is. Thank you for being here. Uh, why thank don't you. you introduce yourself for the record and we'll listen to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for members of the committee. I feel well represented in this committee because I have my actual Senator, Senator Cummings, and my two honorary Senators, uh, the, the, the Rutland delegation, uh, who are here in full, uh, full regalia here for this testimony. Um, I just want to start with a strategy that has worked pretty much throughout my life because you've been hearing from some very smart and uh, well-versed folks on the issue of healthcare, and so I want to just lower expectations for what I'm what I'm going to say, um, and just let you know that I am the spokesperson uh, for the VS for the members of the Benefits Advisory Committee of the VSEA, who are much more um, immersed and well-versed on these issues than I am. But I did consult them about this bill, and uh, they did have some. Um, points that they wanted to make. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that the, the state employees health care plan is perhaps a model. Um, we are, uh, the plan is negotiated as part of collective bargaining and is managed. Um, um, it's a self-insured plan and it is uh, really managed, the, the practical everyday management of the plan is through Blue Cross Blue Shield, but the decisions about the plan are, are really made at the bargaining table where um, the workers and the management have equal power. Um, and also it's overseen by a collaborative effort of labor and uh, participants, um, you know, the, the administration, um, the members of the VSEA and the members of the uh, retirement community work together throughout the year 
uh, to uh, make advisory decisions and to consult on the operation of the plan. And that plan is uh, one of the best plans in the country. It has some of the lowest costs in the country. Uh, and in fact, this year uh, we are um, in the budget going to have um, uh, premium holidays uh, because of the massive amount of surplus in the plan. So I just want to make that point because when, um, when you have a collaborative effort like that, um, you are able to, uh, to manage the plan in the way that the state employees plan um, is managed. So it is a, it is a good um, um, example maybe for healthcare uh, cost containment throughout the state. Um, our members uh, wanted, you know, we are now, uh, as, as of this fall, our, our members' lives have been attributed to the Accountable Care Organization, One Care. It was not the choice of the members of the VSEA to be attributed to One Care. Um, it was out of our control and um, unilaterally decided by the administration. Um, it's not a, it was not a decision that we supported. Uh, our members, uh, I think, would stress what some folks have said is that, that the ACO is not health care reform, it's payment reform. Um, our members feel that there's not enough data uh, around the ACO, AC, ACO to know whether it's being effective and the transparency really needs to be improved and increased. Um, and our folks really believe that this real model should be scrapped and that we should be looking at a model that'll cost something less than $20 million in administrative costs. Um, they think basically this is the wrong approach. Um, and that really, if you want to contain costs, and the state employees plan is an example of this, it's all about access and making ac increasing access, making it less costly, um, making it more available, um, which really means lowering out of pocket costs, um, increasing universal coverage and using, using tax revenues to do that. Um, tax revenues to do that rather than limiting the services that are provided to folks. Um, the other important part that our members uh, wanted to discuss, and it's, you know, it's, clear, it's clear in places like Rutland and other rural communities and throughout the state that we don't have enough health care infrastructure, not enough primary care physicians, um, uh, access to nurse practitioners or specialists um, that would reduce um, would get people the right care at the right time and reduce um, their dependence on more uh, expensive care. Um, the only other point I think, a couple points uh, folks wanted to make was that um, it's really important uh, that um, the consumers that organize labor uh, be included in any study committees that you have that, um, you know, it's both in terms of um, just their experience, which is, with our healthcare plan, uh, vast, but also in our ability um, uh, to Devin's point to get the word out about um, about what's out there um, in the broader marketplace beyond the state employees health insurance plan. There is a lot of infrastructure there, and the only last thing I just want to put it, I know, put it uh, just a quick plug in, and I know this is part of S one thirty two, is that our members are strongly supportive of the coverage for hearing aids um, that is included in that bill. Um, so those, those are just the brief points that our members asked that I make. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Uh, I, I probably will defer to people who actually uh, know more about what they're talking about than I do. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Steve. This is very helpful. I, I don't see any written testimony from you on our webpage. So if you have that, it would be really helpful to send it in to Nellie. We will do that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to keep going. We have two more people who are um, here with us. Uh, Helen Laban of, uh, VP, of VPQHC, FQHCs. The Q always gets me. Uh, thank you for being here, Helen. Uh, thank you. So I am Helen Laban. I am the Vermont Public Policy Director for Bi-State Primary Care Association. You do have written testimony from me on S120. It is uh, succinct for me. It's shorter than my average email. Uh, and I won't restate that here. It does speak broadly to uh, our perspective on payment reform, healthcare delivery reform, and payer reform. I, you know, to, to follow up on points that have been made, I think you've heard it clearly that the idea that direct and immediate reduction of insurance costs and affordability for consumers is not a goal of the all payer model, uh, nor should it be. It's, those are sort of, they're connected, but they are in many ways apples and oranges. 
Um, and we agree that there should be focused legislation and policy efforts to directly reduce those insurance costs for Vermonters. Um, we do not believe that S120 necessarily achieves that as currently presented. I did not do a close line by line and suggestion for other options in the way that Boz has done. However, I'd be more than happy to crib off of their work uh, and review that testimony and provide additional line by line ideas on behalf of BICE if that's something that would be helpful to you. Uh, so uh, kudos to Devin for being very constructive in that way and, and I, can, I can replicate. Um, I do want to make a quick point that I think has come up a little bit, but not been as strongly stated as FQHCs feel it. So we are federally qualified health centers. The federal part of that is, is key. Um, we do provide health care, primary care and preventive care access to about a third of Vermonters through our membership. And we also provide access for about 45% of Medicare beneficiaries. Um, we strive to be highly responsive to our local communities, to be innovative, to do uh, a range of services and to reach the most vulnerable Vermonters. That being said, we are both funded and regulated by the federal government. So we don't have an option to move forward on healthcare reform that is not in alignment with the federal government. And that's really what the all payer model allows us to do. It brings in our federal partners into Vermont's healthcare reform initiatives and lets us all move forward together. We don't, we don't want to be in a point where we have to choose between what Vermont wants to do and what the federal government wants to do. That is an impossible choice for us. We would be unable to do anything in that situation. And for that reason, it's critically important to us that the all payer model exists and provide that alignment because I. I literally don't know what we will do if we don't have that alignment. Um, and so that's really a, a key and critical point. In, and we have heard clearly from the federal government and are told uh, you know, on, on a monthly basis that value-based payment reform is what we need to be doing and we are contracted with to support that. Uh, so we will be forever uh, strongly in favor of value-based payment reform and that alignment. So that's really the, the point that I wanted to bring home. I believe that one of my members is also on the line and I would uh, not take up additional time that could be uh, spent hearing from how this is playing out on the ground. So thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you um, and thank you for your written testimony. Um, I think if you concur with other things that um, you mentioned, uh, Devin Green's testimony, if, uh, if you concur with some other testimony, whether it's Devin or others, you know, please do let us know that. It's nice to have some triangulation along the way. And we've certainly heard that um, from different folks. Thank you. Um, we also have Michael Costa here. You are here. Thank you for being here, Michael. And I don't know if we have anything in writing from you. Yes, uh, Senator, uh, I submitted something in writing and I'm happy to speak to it. Thank you. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and then we'll hear your testimony. Good morning. Uh, thank you to the committee for, for having me here. I know you're quite busy. Um, my name is Michael Costa and thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding S120 and related topics in healthcare reform. Presently, I serve as Chief Executive Officer of Northern County's Healthcare in St. Johnsbury, uh, which is a health system consisting of a federally qualified health center with five primary care sites, three dental sites, and an express care clinic. Uh, and we're also a Medicare certified home care and hospice agency. Uh, I also serve on the board of directors for the Bi-State Primary Care Association, the VNAs of Vermont, uh, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Centers and One Care Vermont ACO. Prior to that, as many of you on the committee know, I served as deputy commissioner of DIVA uh, during the present administration. And part of my duties was to bring to life DIVA's healthcare reform efforts, particularly regarding payment reform. Prior to that role, I served as uh, Deputy Director of Healthcare Reform for Governor Shumlin, which included being on the negotiating team for the all pair model and working on Green Mountain Care and the Universal Primary Care Studies, among others. So, you know, I left Diva, even though it was the best job I'd ever had in my life except for a summer at Carvel Ice Cream, um, for the following reason. You know, after years of working on Vermont's vision for healthcare reform and time implementing that vision at Medicaid, I wanted to be involved at the point of care. Uh, that pivot from focusing on healthcare reform vision to execution has been really illuminating, particularly during COVID. 
And for me, it's instilled an extraordinary amount of humility. Uh, I think of the term delivery system reform really differently now because I have a responsibility for our team which cares for people 365 days a year. And I watch our clinicians and our nurses and our personal care attendants care for people who are frail and elderly and sometimes really scared. And you know that experience hasn't dimmed my belief in the need for reform, but it has made me appropriately respectful of the scope of the project. So the transition to value-based care, which I know the committee has taken a lot of testimony about, um, and value-based payments that would allow us to focus on how to make communities physically healthy, mentally healthy, well-housed, well-nourished, and financially secure, it requires time and trust and effective risk management. So each day as CEO, I have to decide how aggressive or conservative I want to be about transitioning Northern counties to value-based care. You know, I have to decide what portion of our time, money, and talent and, and my own credibility as a leader is allocated to that project. And the healthcare reform bills this session and particularly recent comments made by the state's, state's chief healthcare regulator have a chilling effect on our reform efforts at the provider organization level. I'm left to wonder whether the present approach will continue or whether Vermont will find a new vision for healthcare reform, um, which would be our third in the last 10 years. And that uncertainty creates real dilemmas. So do I work with one care on a capitated payment model for FQHCs for 2022? Or do I wait until a new agreement is signed with the federal government? Do I invest in population health management or do I take on an electronic health record project, which would take a year and quite a bit of money? Uh, do I add more wraparound services? Because so many of our people come into our clinics and their problem primarily is not a healthcare problem. They have other issues that we need to help them with. Or do I, do I be more cautious about that because I may lose the substantial support we get from one care? Uh, do I add a clinical pharmacist? Because more and more of the problems that our patients have are complex pharmacology, right? How all their drug interactions work together. Now that'd be great for my patients and it would reduce visit volume which is great in a value-based world, um, but do I take on that expense now and potentially be stuck in fee-for-service for a long time um, and then have to wait to see what the state's next commitments are on healthcare reform? And so this is just a few uh, of the many trade-offs that healthcare leaders have to make when thinking about the operational imperative of the present and then the transition to future innovation. And so, you know, Vermont, in my view, is, is rightly viewed as a leader in thinking about creating a more just and equitable healthcare system. Yet, you know, what I found in the transition from state government to the provider community was that policy vision is only as good as the execution by those healthcare organizations. So I would just ask the committee to consider the effect on healthcare leaders and organizations of potentially diverting attention away from the all pair model and considering a new way forward. So that, that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much for all you do for Vermont and Vermonters. Um, and thank you for what has been really uh, probably the best Zoom meeting I've had this week. You are all getting really, really good at this. So, oh, I can't We were you. almost good. I didn't uh, unmute myself, um, but I just wanna say thank you. We've had a lot of practice at Zoom, you know, ever since last March. Uh, I think the day that this committee started was March 13th or 16th after we got off the telephone. Um, and we've been doing it through the summer, the fall and continuing so. But thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your, um, for your comments. It's good to see you again. And we very much appreciate your, um, your testimony. Thank you very much. Yeah. Terrific. So I, I don't think there is anyone else uh, with us this morning who has asked to testify and, and frankly, committee, I think that it's time for us to close the testimony loop on this one uh, on the bills and then for us to dive into some consideration of what we have heard and um, some recommendations perhaps for amending um, one or both bills. So before we begin that conversation, um, my suggestion is that we take a little break. It's been a very intense morning. We've heard a lot of good testimony and uh, we have, I think we deserve a little uh, time to stretch our minds and our bodies. So let's, um, looking at the time and, and what we have before us, we also have the budget memo we wanna firm up. Uh, so let's take, a, oh, 
I hate to say 15. Let's come back at 1045. That's a 14. Thank you.